must satisfy that at the end of the day, when all the transactions are done, your database is still in a consistent state. Consistent state means that it satisfy all constraints. In other words, yes, you can interleave action from different transactions as much as you want, but make sure at the end of the day, you do not violate any constraints defined against your database. Assuming, of course, each transaction by itself will not result in any violation of the constraint defined against your database. With that assumption, no matter how you interleave these actions, you should make sure you find a schedule where interleaving action from different transactions will not lead to a violation of any constraint defined against your database. Okay? So that's what consistency uh, is about. That being said, we now understand what is the so-called ASCII properties. And in particular, I think this consistency requirement is actually fairly easy to understand, fairly easy to enforce. Why? Because as long as you have a module sitting within the database kernel that checks the constraints at all time, then no matter how you interleave action from different transactions, those constraints will be enforced at all time. So that's easy to enforce. Okay? So what I'm going to do next is focus on discussing the other properties. How does a database kernel ensure the other properties? And in particular, I will start with isolation. And then I will talk about how to do a Thompson and durability uh, in another slide. In your lab, let me say, in your lab 5 on transaction, essentially you're going to implement a bare bone structure of transaction manager with the support of isolation. I do not ask you to implement the support for autonomy and durability. Meaning correctly, I mean, a part of it, but not the full part of it. You will understand what I mean by that when we touch on those topics. So let's go to this particular part. How, how does the database kernel ensure isolation? Okay. For that, we will use uh, this module called concurrency control. So I explained to you what a semaphore is about. Right? At the very beginning of the discussion on transactions, we talked about semaphore. And semaphore was invented a long time ago for control uh, trains coming in and out of a train station. Right? We have uh, many, many tracks that come together. How do you avoid collisions from different trains on different tracks? Well, you use semaphore, right? So this is sample. This, this guy are called sample. Yeah. In, 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 in the context of in the context of train station, right? You, they do not call them traffic light. Right? Of course, you can you can still understand them as traffic light, but essentially that's sample. Yeah. Now, sample four is used to do what we call concurrent execution of different transactions. And concurrent execution of different transactions really is to satisfy the given isolation level requirement. Right? If you're in serializable isolation level, I should do this. If you're in repeatable read isolation level, I should do that. So in our discussion, we will focus on serializable isolation level. So suppose your database engine is set to serializable isolation level, how does the data kernel actually uh, support that. Okay, that's what we will be discussing next. So the technical workflow is that users submit transactions, and because of the isolation requirement, a particular user can think of each transaction as executing by itself, without worrying about the fact that, oh, many other users may be accessing my database at the same time. This isolation level concept is really useful for users to reason about his or her transaction without worrying about other actions by other users, right? Because without this requirement, without this property, it's really hard for anyone to actually use your database, right? Because I'm trying to, for example, move student record from arc from apply to archive. What if somebody tries to update student record in the meantime? How should I rewrite my code? Without isolation, you need to worry about all these issues. But with isolation, you don't have to worry about those issues. You know what I mean? Right? That's the point of isolation, right? But the challenge is, 
how is it actually done inside a database engine? So this actually is the review of autonomous CDNs and uh, acid properties. So I will skip all those. I will go directly to this example where I sh actually I have used this example already. This this balance transfer between two accounts, right? So I have two transactions. Transaction one basically says I'm gonna move balance between two of my accounts. I'm gonna move hundred dollars from account A to account B. And suppose this happened around the same time when bank decides to issue. Uh, some interest to all the accounts uh, within that bank. In particular, it decides to give 10% interest rate uh, to all the accounts. So what it does is to do this too. Of course, there could be more accounts than just A and B, right? But for illustration purposes, I will assume there are only two accounts uh, that's affected by this action. So uh, we only do interest uh, rates for those two accounts. So your level isolation level says you must ensure the execution of these two transactions, the execution of these two transactions leaves the database in a state that's equivalent to either or if. Right? That's what we mean by So isolation, right? So you can interleave action from different transactions, but at the end of the day, it must be equal, equivalent to either this or that. And there are different ways you can interleave them, as I demonstrated to you last time in, uh, in Whiteboard. So I'm going to repeat this example right here. So I can do that. Or I can do this or this. Do this, right? So the first one actually is okay. If you check it, it's the same effect as as what? As if you do T1 then T2. Right? The same the first schedule of interleaving action from those two transactions leads to a state where is it is exactly equivalent to this. So that first one is okay. But what about this approach. This approach is not okay. It favors the account holder because basically you get interest twice on that hundred dollar. So from a bank policy view, you do not want to see this. Right? Of course, there is another trans uh, scheduling option I, I didn't show here, which is you. Uh, you swap these two and swap these two. That way, the bank avoids giving out any interest at all to the hundred dollar. So bank will favor that, but account holder will be uh, disappointed with that approach. Right? So either of these two is not okay. The reason is there. If you check it, it's not equivalent to this, nor is it equivalent to this. That's why it's, it is not in what we call serialized by simulation levels. Right? Now that being understood, the challenge now is to design a mechanism that runs within the data kernel that can automatically figure out which is okay, which is not okay. Right? That's the challenge. Right? So the way we're gonna do this is to use a really simple abstract view of transaction executions inside a database kernel. This abstraction basically says the following. From a transaction manager point of view, I don't really care what you are doing within a transaction. What's the semantic application or semantic implication of your transaction? For example, I don't really want to care you are moving $100 from account A to account B or you are giving out interest. From transaction manager's point of view, all you are doing is you read the value of some object. Then you go around and do something about that. And you come back, ask me to write some value back to the object. Whether it's moving $100 away from the account or giving 10% interest, irrelevant. From my point of view, all you are doing is you read the value of A, 
you do something about it that I don't care. That's you do in buffer manager and you the CPU instruction execute it against a page in my buffer, and then you come back ask me to write the value away. Right? Whether you plus hundred dollar or plus a million dollar irrelevant. Now coming here, what you ask me to do is read the value of A again. You do something about it, here you give interest out. Well, it's actually six percent interest. Something that lowered the interest rate. Okay. So you write the value back. You read the value B, you write the value of B back. Then finally you read the value B again and write value B back. Of course, by this are actions from different transactions, <coughs> different together, right? together. So this is the abstraction we're gonna use in our discussion, right? So I we're gonna ignore the semantic implication of those actions. Rather we focus on only the read and write from uh, those actions. And that helps us greatly simplify the discussion and focus on the important challenges we need to address. Okay? Now, to understand why this particular schedule, this schedule, is not okay, we cannot ignore this. We just focus on this. Just focus on this. So, what is not okay with that schedule? For that, to initiate that discussion, let me first introduce a couple of concepts. A couple of concepts. The first concept is what we call serial schedule. Uh, these are Meaning there are no interleaving of action from any transaction. You execute that in true isolation, one by one. <laughs> then that's a serial schedule. Okay? This is fairly simple to understand. And next, I will introduce a concept called equivalent schedules. The equivalent schedule says two schedules are equivalent if they, at the end of the day they leave database in the same state. Then they're equivalent. For example, this schedule is equivalent, uh, equivalent schedule to this schedule. Because at the end of the day, they leave database in the same state. So far, so good? Okay. Fairly simple concept. And, but, but this one is not equivalent to any of this. Yeah. However, this one is equivalent to if you were to swap these two actions. Then those are equivalent schedules. If you swap these two actions, then that leads to a equivalent schedule. So far, so good. With with these two concepts in hand, we can introduce the uh, the final concept that's that's really important to our discussion, which is what we call serializable schedule. Serializable schedule. Serializable schedule is a schedule where it is a equivalent schedule to some serial schedules. That's the definition of serializable schedule. And that means that this, the first one on top, is a serializable schedule. Why? It is because it is a equivalent schedule to one of you serial schedules. So it's a serializable schedule. This one at the bottom, or this one, this two, it is not a serializable schedule because it is not equivalent to any one of you serial schedules. You only have two serial schedules here, and it's not equivalent to any one of these. So, it is not a serializable schedule. Okay? With this concept in hand, now, you agree, now we can formalize what's the requirement for serializable isolation level. What's the requirement for serializable isolation level? Well, the requirement for serializable isolation level is very simple, which is to only allow and permit what? Serializable schedule. To only allow and permit serializable schedule, if you somehow manage to do that, you are in serializable isolation level, guaranteed. Because that's basically the definition, right? But if you only allow serializable, if you only allow serializable schedule, then no matter what you do, you end up to be equivalent to a serial schedule, which is precisely the definition of serializable isolation level. So the the problem of building serializable isolation level reduce is reduced to Finding schedules that are serializable schedules. These two now are equivalent. Okay? These two problems now are equivalent. Right? So now we're going to focus on 
how we design survival scan. How we design survival scan. And for that purpose, we're going to introduce what we call anomalies between actions. Anomalies between actions. Anomalies between actions. In particular, we're going to introduce three types of anomalies. Three types of anomalies. The first anomaly is what we call read and write conflict. Or uh, uh, write and read conflict. Let's see. Maybe I'll make a mistake. Yeah, so WR conflicts. WR conflicts. What this says is a transaction in U schedule, one transaction attempts to read an uncommitted data by another transaction, by another transaction. So for example, in this particular schedule, this is a WR conflict on A. Why? Because your transaction two is trying to read the value A written by transaction one which is not committed yet. You may wonder, what's the problem with that? What's the problem of reading uncommitted data by another transaction? Can someone try to think about why we want to prevent this from happening? Yeah? I mean, like at the end of the T1, you have a board. What happens if they board? Yeah. Then it's fine, but if it's not, then... Yeah, that's right. So, this goes back, I think I have talked about this, cascading abort. And if the rollback of a board of one transaction leads to the rollback and the board of other transactions. If you allow WR conflict to exist in your schedule, if you allow WR conflict to exist in your schedule, meaning you allow one transaction to read uncommitted data by another transaction, you introduce a potential risk of cascading abort. For example, in this case, instead of, so, so proceed, okay, and T2 has committed, that's important. T2 actually has committed right here, and T1 come back and abort. And then you have to tell T2 to come back and abort, even though T2 has already committed. This doesn't make sense. You will puzzle the users, right? It's, it's like somebody go to vote and get the, the speaker and vote it. And then receive a call. Oh, because the other person didn't vote properly, you have to come back and re-vote it. That's not okay. <coughs> People are not going to like systems like that, right? Either you say, okay, you do not allow T2 to commit. You do not allow T2 to commit. And oh, one, that's one possible solution, by the way. If you want to allow WR conflict, which is if you have a WR conf conflict, meaning one transaction reads an uncommitted data by another transaction, one way to fix that is the second transaction cannot commit until the first one has committed. That way you ensure there will be no cascading abort. However, if you do that, that goes against the concept of what? Isolation. That goes against the concept of isolation, right? Because isolation, all isolation says is Transactions should not worry about what other transactions are doing. Do you follow me? So that goes against the very principle of isolation. So we should not allow WR conflicts. Okay? So that's one type of anomaly. Very easy to understand. Okay? The second one is what we call RW conflict. RW conflict. By the way, when I say WR or RW, Obviously, it refers to the same object, right? If you write object B and the other transaction read object A, <coughs> that's okay. There's no conflict whatsoever there. It must be on the same object. Secondly, this WR action are from different transactions. If it's from the same transaction, obviously it's okay. I write something, I read something, that's okay. Because you are still one transaction, there's no cascading abort to begin with. Okay? What's, what's, what's wrong with RW conflict? Meaning, like this. This is, this is the RW conflict. Huh? RW conflict. RW conflict. Sorry, RW conflict. You read the value A, somebody then write the value A. So one transaction read an object A, then another transaction come back and write the object, uh, write the value of A for the object. What's the potential challenge for that? Well, 
keep in mind we are in serializable <laughs> isolation lab, right? We are not in repeatable read isolation. In serializable, in, sorry, we are in serializable isolation, which is a stronger requirement than repeatable read isolation. If repeatable read isolation level already doesn't allow you to see the same item by multiple times to change value, obviously serializable isolation level will not allow that to happen as well because it is a stronger isolation level than repeatable read. For that argument, we cannot allow RW conflict because if you do allow RW conflict, it's potential, <coughs> it's potential risk that the same object you have read already might have changed values because the right operation from another transaction. So, for example, so these two bit on the same object A might have changed values. You me? That's why we cannot allow R W conflict. We cannot allow R W conflict to ensure item write multiple times are not going to change value. <laughs> Looking at that, is there any reason why, like in our optimizer or maybe somewhere else, you could see, you could look at T1 and say, okay, you're reading from A, and then later you're going to just read from A again. That's uh, a duplicate thing, there's no sense of doing that, and just removing it. That's a good question. So the question is, why you are reading the same object twice? Why do you want to do that? Why somebody wants to read the same object twice, right? Why don't you just remove uh, the read of the, the second object? Well, <coughs> this goes back to, this is actually not a problem pertaining to just transaction, right? So in your coding of any program, so the fundamental question you are asking is, should we allow a programmer or a program to be able to read the same object twice? Or should we just simply forbid that? prevent that from happening altogether. If you think about it, obviously we cannot prevent this from happening. Right? It's like recursion. You have to be able to read the same object class if you want to support recursion. And there are many, many reasons where you have to allow this. So you cannot simply say, I do not allow you to read the same object twice. So, but in, case, in one transaction or in programming context in one thread. Right? So yeah. in, that, in that case, though, you might potentially be changing that variable. But in this case, um, like we're reading RA, and then like the next thing we're doing is reading RA. So if you like setting the variable to 7, and then the next line is set that variable to 7. Well, I, I'm using this. This is a very extremely simplified example. Right? I mean, there could be other things going on between, but that's just irrelevant to our discussion, so we just remove that. But you, you can imagine there are maybe other actions here but just relevant to this discussion, they are just removed. Okay. And also keep in mind, the other thing I want to keep in mind, I want to remind you is, these things happen in an online fashion. You cannot see the future. You do not know at this point that the same transaction will come back and request the value of A or B. You cannot predict what the future looks like. It's an active online transaction. That's why transaction in Davis is called OLTP. TP is easy to find as a transaction processing. What's OL? Online transaction. So it's online, it's not offline. So whatever we do, we have to figure out a way to do this in an online fashion without knowing the future. Right? That makes the problem much more challenging <coughs> than if you know. So I, we understand why we can allow WR conflict or RW conflict. Right? Finally, the last anomaly is a little bit less obvious to understand compared to the other two, which is WW conflict. So look at this particular example. I have one transaction write the value of A, and then before that transaction come back and write the value of B, the other transaction comes in and write value A and B and commit. And then the first transaction comes and write the value of B and commit. In my mind, what's wrong with this? Looks okay, right? Uh, what's wrong with it? There is a WW conflict, meaning this pair or this pair, right? Both transactions are writing the same object. 
the potential challenge of allowing WW conflict is that it's no longer a serializable schedule. It cannot be equivalent to one of the two serial schedules. What are the two serial schedules here? T1, then T2, or T2, then T1. In the first case, what's the final value of A and B? Well, the final value of A and B are determined by T2. What about the second case? What's the value of what's the final value of A and B? It's determined by T1. But if you allow WW conflict to exist, what happens? Well, it's potential that the value of A is determined by T2, the value of B is determined by T1. So by definition, it is not a serialized scatter. It's, it's really subtle, but if you think through, you see why WW copy is not okay. For serialized <coughs> isolation level, for serialized isolation level. And this guy, if you think about it, is actually totally okay for repeatable rate isolation level. There's no delay rate. Action back down time to launch in five. So this schedule is allowed in repeatable rate as well, but it's not okay in serial as well. Do you follow the argument? Why is it okay in repeatable rate? First of all, there's no dirty rate. There's no rate at all, anyways. So it cannot be a dirty rate. Second, the action back mountain time cannot change value. No action has been back mountain time by the same transaction. So of course it's okay in repeatable. But it's not okay in the right level now because it's not equal to this or that. Okay? So, using these two simple slides, now we understand how to ensure the right level as a right? To get the right level schedule, essentially what we want to have is no. RW conflict, no WR conflict, and no WW conflict. As long as these three are checked, good news. You are in survival aspect Or you are going to have survival sky, hence you will be in survival isolation. So we reduce the problem to this. Okay? To this. The next question is. The next question is, how do we ensure there are no such conflicts in an online fashion, right? That's critical, in an online fashion, in a truly online fashion. Online, this problem actually can be easily solved. If I give you all the action from all the transactions, you can come up with a schedule without any of these conflicts. Fairly easy, fairly easy, fairly easy. Okay. What, what about doing this in an online fashion? For that, we introduce this famous, famous protocol called two-phase locking protocol. Uh, there are two variations, so let me introduce each one of them. There's a subtle difference of the two. You know, two-phase locking protocol by itself is not hard to understand. What's difficult to understand is the difference between the two variations it offers. Okay? So let me try to uh, explain this to uh, the best way I can to you. Okay? So first of all, we start with the basic form of two-phase locking, which is called strict, strict two-phase locking protocol, strict TPR. Strict TPR. And this is what you will be implementing in your lab file. You will implement strict TPR in your lab file. Okay? So what's strict TPR? First of all, I introduced a concept called locks. We introduced a concept called locks. And locks it, are introduced over objects in your database. Object can be a tuple, a record, a table, or even the whole database. Right? So now, let's simplify our discussion. Let's say object is simply just a record in your database, okay? Now let's think about record as just a single record. Right. We write A, A, in, 
assuming to simplify the discarding A and B are simply backwarding our digits, okay? That's one thing. And logs, we introduce two type of logs. One is called exclusive log. The other is called shared log. And this is known as X, this is known as S. And I'm going to introduce this compatible table, log compatible table. It says, Object A, I'm going to introduce what we call compatible table. What it says is, exclusive log is not compatible with the exclusive log. A exclusive log on A is not compatible with a shared log. Vice versa, but a shared log on A is compatible with a shared log on A. What that means is, if some transaction, if some transaction is holding a shared log on object A. Another transaction requesting a share log on A can proceed. So multiple transaction can hold a share log on A at the same time. However, if there is one transaction holding an exclusive log on object A, then no other transaction can acquire any log, exclusive or share, on that object A. That's what it means. Okay? So that's first of all the concept of log. And two types of two types of logs. Uh, straight to phase locking uh, protocol is using. That being said, straight to phase locking is very simple. It says the following Each transaction must obtain a share lock on an object before reading. So if you attempt to read A, what do you do? Before that, you must do this. If you try to write the object A, before that, what you must do? You must, sorry, you must extend, uh, obtain an exclusive log on A. You follow my argument? What if you try to obtain an exclusive log on A? So this is T1. And T2 has, before you, obtain an exclusive log on A and write the value of A. Now you try to, T1 try to obtain the exclusive log on A, what happened to this? Well, it will be blocked. So you cannot proceed to write the value of A. It will be blocked because of this. You follow me? What about this? If T2 has already a shared log on A and made the value of A, Oh, that's okay. You can proceed. But in that scenario, this will be blocked. Okay? Because this exclusive lock is not okay with the shared lock over there, so this whole thing will be blocked right here. Okay, so that's the idea. So this first requirement is to introduce to you how to acquire locks, right? You must have a way to release logs. You cannot just acquire logs. Right? If you keep acquiring logs, nobody can proceed. So there must be a way for transactions to release logs. Right? So that's when it differs. There are two variations of two-phase 